All right. I, I want to switch to Saudi Arabia because I think fascinating things are happening in Saudi Arabia. Or at least I hope so. And uh, uh, exactly what happens there has huge impact on us. Uh, why does that have a huge impact on us? Because the fact is that the Saudi royal family and Saudi billionaires, millionaires, whatever, uh, Saudi charities, are the largest funders of terrorism, maybe the second largest funders of terrorism after Iran in the world. Every time you see a radicalized individual, they were radicalized by somebody who was funded or trained by the Saudis. You see, a long time ago, more than 200 years ago, the Saudi war family, the Saud family, cut a deal with a sect of religious fanatics called the Wahhabis. The Wahhabis wanted to return to fundamentalist script-based, uh, jihad-based Islam. And they said that uh, the only way Islam would ever achieve its glory days again is if they went back to a strict interpretation of Sharia law. And basically the deal was that we, you Wahhabis, rally uh, the people around us as monarchs and we will leave the spiritual world. We will leave the teaching. We will not challenge your dominance of the teaching of Islam. So you get religion, we get the state. Separation of state and church, right? And uh, we will run the state based on your spiritual guidance. You know, as long as you don't interfere with our ability to accumulate money, to go have orgies in Monaco, to drive fancy cars, to, 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 to hang out in the Western bars and drink and do all that. As long as you don't interfere with that, you can preach whatever you want to preach, fund whatever you want to fund. And what's happened over the last, certainly over the last 40 years, since 1979, is partially in order to compete with Iran. The Wahhabis uh, have, have uh, basically gone out there and helped fund all the radicalized Islamic movements around the world. So they, they were behind Al-Qaeda. They were at least originally very sympathetic to the Muslim Brotherhood and funded the Muslim Brotherhood and helped the Muslim Brotherhood when the Egyptians kicked them out. They were ultimately funding and behind ISIS. They are behind every mosque in the United States or in Pakistan, or any madras, the, 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 the school that teaches Islam, in Pakistan or in Afghanistan that radicalized people to join the Taliban, or, or any one of the Islamist terrorist organizations, all of that, if it's Sunni, the Muslims are either Shia or Sunni, if it's Sunni, it's funded by Saudi Arabia. And the royal family has basically stayed out of it. I think some members of the royal family support this, fund it, encourage it, other members of the royal family just stay out of it. They're too busy with the orgies or whatever. And, uh, you know, they've been trying to be friends with the United States, so they don't want to be perceived as enemies of the United States. But as the, as the information leaked out on 9-11, it's clear that there was a Saudi at least linked to the royal family connection to the 9-11 terrorist attack. The Saudis were involved, Saudi officials from the royal family were involved. And remember, this royal family constitutes thousands of people because of how many wives each man can have and because how many wives each king has had and how many children they have. They have lots of children from lots of wives and they're just thousands of these siblings. So it's a massive royal family which controls every aspect of life in Saudi Arabia except religion. That they have given over to the Wahhabis. Now comes this Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, and he is 32 years old, and he has been educated in the West, and he has consolidated power. He is the defense minister. He's basically in charge of internal security and in charge of economic policy. He is the heir to the current king, Salman bin Abdulaziz, that means Solomon, son of Abdulaziz, and he will become king unless there's a coup or unless he gets killed. But Prince Muhammad bin Solomon is expected to be king. Indeed, it's expected that Solomon will, uh, will actually um, resign as king, abdicate, abdicate is the formal word, abdicate as king, 
in order to allow a smooth transition so his son can take over. Anyways, 32. And he claims to be more modern. He claims to want to reform Saudi Arabia. He claims to want to take away some of the religious authority from the Wahhabis. He has actually put some Wahhabi preachers, some of the more radical Wahhabi preachers, in jail. He has just recently arrested dozens of his own family members on charges of corruption, which is bizarre because, of course, they're corrupt. Everybody's corrupt. The, the whole basis of the Saudi economy is corruption for the royal family, sucking out all the wealth created, very little of it, all, almost all from oil. But so to me, it's more than just, it's not really corruption. What it is is a power grab. He's eliminating all his cousins and, and, and his and other family members who might have claim to the throne or might have different ideas about policy. Now, at the same time, he's also telling the West, we're going to reform. We're going to allow women to drive. We're going we're gonna to loosen up our religious restrictions. We're going to reduce our support of some of this, these radicalized mosques overseas. We're going to shut down some of these Wahhabi extremists. And, you know, he's also in the process of taking the Saudi Arabian oil company. I mean, it's funny to call it a company because it's basically the oil family um, and take it public. And they, they want to float 5% of it. And, and they think that by the time it's, it's finished, it would be valued at well over a trillion dollars, which will make it the largest publicly traded company in the world, more valuable than Apple and Google combined, I think. Uh, and the problem is, that if they, if they take the company public in London or in New York, then they're going to have to abide by London and New York kind of disclosures and rules. And they don't want to. They don't want to disclose how the money's used. They don't want to disclose where the money goes. So now they're talking about, oh, maybe, maybe we'll just do it on the Saudi stock exchange. So a huge amount of going on in Saudi Arabia right now. It's fascinating. At the same time, at the same time, they claim that the money they get, over $100 billion from this sale of stock, they're going to use to divest their economy. I mean, by 2020, or at the very least, latest by 2030, oil will not be the primary source of revenue, the primary source of income for Saudi Arabia, that it will have a diverse economy. Really? Is that really, is that even a possibility? Do they have the resources? Do they have the, never mind the capital, the money? Do they have the brain power? Do they have the people? <coughs> the expertise, the knowledge to do that. It's interesting. So the, 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 he's got a whole plan. He's going to reveal, I think, next week on how to completely reform the Saudi economy and at the same time reduce the, impact, the, the influence of Sharia law and, and, and the religious clerics on life in Saudi Arabia. And he's arresting his opponents, and he's not just arresting them. Last week, a helicopter carrying seven members of the royal family, relatively senior princes in this bizarre hierarchy, it had an accident and it crashed and everybody died. Now, nobody believes it was an accident. And again, getting rid of opponents, consolidating power. Now, add to that the fact that he is in particular a hawk when it comes to his perception of the Iranian threat. He believes Iran is Saudi Arabia's number one enemy. He believes Iran is the number one destabilizing force in the Middle East. So he is fighting Iran in Yemen, Yemen is a country that was taken over by pro-Iranian forces, Shiite pro-Iranian forces, not long ago. And he is fighting a war in Yemen over uh, Iran's influence in the Arabian Peninsula. He is fighting, I think they initially supported ISIS because they were trying to fight Iranian influence in Iraq and Iranian influence in Syria. Now that kind of, that kind of blew up in their face. And now... You know, they're really worried because Iran is in Yemen to their south. Iran is in Iraq to the north. Iran is in Syria to the north. Iran dominates Lebanese politics to the northwest. And an interesting thing happened this week relating to Lebanon. The prime minister of Lebanon was visiting Saudi Arabia. And during that visit, he resigned and has not been seen since. <laughs> the intrigue just keeps building. He is a, uh, he is a uh, Saudi-appointed prime minister, if you will, of, of Lebanon. Lebanon is dominated by Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a terrorist arm of Iran. 
And again, I think the Saudis are trying to make a, a play. They've told it, it, Saudi Arabian citizens not to go to Lebanon, not to be in Lebanon, not to invest in Lebanon, they, they, a complete ban on Lebanon. So Saudi Arabia is playing a geopolitical game here, trying to protect the Middle East from Iran's influence. And, and I think a lot of this has to do with America's weakness. And, and you know, the, the fact that America is not leading um, if you will, the attack on Iran, the, the, the protection against Iran. Iran's developing new, uh, ballistic missiles. It's probably developing nuclear weapons. It's, um, it, it threatens not just Israel, but it threatens Saudi Arabia with those weapons. I wouldn't be surprised if you'll see the uh, Saudis trying to buy nuclear weapons from the Pakistanis, who are Sunnis. And what you're seeing is, is, a, is, a, is an arms race, a power struggle, uh, and it's fascinating. And, and partially what's happening is the Saudi Arabia is getting closer to Israel. Now, it won't actually declare that. But unofficially, there are talks constantly between Israel and Saudi Arabia, particularly about Iran and Syria and Iraq and Lebanon. And uh, one, suspect, one would suspect that if Israel actually attacked Iran because it viewed Iran as a threat, <coughs> a nuclear threat, that Saudi Arabia would actually let it use its airspace. I'm not sure the Americans. The Trump administration would let Israel use Saudi airspace, um, but I think Saudi Arabia would. So alliances are shifting. And where's the United States in all of this? No way. No way. I mean, uh, uh, Obama <coughs> basically had an anti-American foreign policy that basically said, um, yeah, we're going to support our enemies. Uh, we're going to let ISIS grow up. We're, we're not going to fight them. We're, we're, we're going to leave the Iranians alone because they're not a threat. We're going to kind of deal with them and, and we're going to, we're going to, you know, just be friendly with everybody. Trump um, has, I think, no foreign policy. So it's not that he hates America. He just doesn't have anything. Uh, he's done nothing in the Middle East so far other than dance with the Arabian princes in the Saudi Arabia, uh, demand very little from them, uh, demand almost nothing from them. The State Department actually was backing this guy, uh, the Solomon's opponents for a while. Uh, so there is no foreign policy in the Middle East. We don't know what we're doing. It's basically being run by the Russians and the Iranians. Russia and Iranian now, Russia and Iran are now the dominant forces in the Middle East, other than, of course, Israel. Uh, the United States is out of the game. It, it's not a participant. It, it's, not, it's not there. And the Saudis feel that vacuum and are trying to fill it. Now, I'm not saying the United States should be there. I, I think it should because it should defend itself. And I think there are people who want to kill us, and, uh, and, and we should be defending ourselves from those people. But I think we've been too involved in the intrigues of the Middle East, that the Middle Eastern has handled the intrigues. All we need to do, and, and this will be my final statement on this issue, all we need to do as America is say, if you mess with us, we'll destroy you. If you fund mosques where people get radicalized and kill Americans, we'll destroy you. If you fund terrorism, that kills Americans anywhere in the world will destroy you. So just behave, people. We're not going to intervene in your internal matters. You're not, we're not going to intervene in your intrigues. Just beware. Uh, oh, by the way, Iran, if you, if you really are developing nuclear weapons, we'll destroy you. We're not going to have nuclear weapons in the hands of a theocracy dedicated to the death of America. Ain't happening. Not under, not under Yaron Brooks' watch, maybe under Trump's watch, maybe under Obama's watch, maybe under Bush's watch, but not under my watch. Well, I'm not going to have a watch because I'm never going to be president. All right. All right. It's about that time. Yeah.